Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. I want to be a playwright. I want to be an actor. I want to be a producer. I want to be a landowner. I want to be the head of a company called BroadwayHD.com. I want to be Stuart Lane, and that's who I have today. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Tell me about the family, your father's side and then your mother's side, how they arrived in America. Well, my father came over on the boat uh, around 1900. Uh, he was able to establish himself as a furniture store owner in the, uh, in the, here in New York. He uh, was very successful with it. They actually had a, a townhouse in the Lower East Side and they had a housekeeper. Uh, and the census taken in 1919 when my father was born, they described the household. Uh, then unfortunately, uh, in 1929 when the stock market crashed and the depression hit, they lost everything. And uh, my father at 10 years old decided that he was gonna go out there and make some good money and that's not going to happen to him. And he went on to live the American dream. Tell me about your mother's side. Uh, my mother came from Russia. Uh, her father was a tailor, didn't speak the language. And yet he was able to come here and put two of his sons through medical school. One went into the business. One a daughter became a high school principal. And the other one was an economics major at Brooklyn College. And how did mom and dad meet? Uh, they met in the Catskills, teachers re retreat for a weekend. Dad was an entrepreneur. After, after the war, what did he get involved with? Well, he was able to get a, a teaching degree from uh, Columbia University and uh, then got drafted. Uh, even though he held three jobs at the time, he was in the Signal Corps, Merchant Marine Academy, and he was teaching a high school, but they, they drafted him. Uh, and when he came out, he started working at the Veterans Administration. Because he was a teacher, he was the first recognized Regents Accepted High School Diploma at Home School. And with the help of the GI Bill, he was able to give high school students who'd never graduated uh, a degree, a real degree. And he created like a correspondence program for a number of courses, right? Well, he expanded into vocational areas. So if you wanted radio repair or TV repair, he was the place to go to. Now, had he then changed, which later on has an impact on your life, to get involved with Rapid America? Well, he had a lawyer, Harry Wachtel, who was representing this, uh, this uh, Israeli from Minneapolis called Mishulam Rickless. And uh, they met and they hit it off and uh, Rickless had this idea of uh, leveraged buyouts and uh, they became really good friends. And my father ended up becoming one of the largest shareholders of the company outside the immediate Rickless family. Uh, and that was about 1955. And by 59, Rick invited him into the corporation, said, you know, you're a major influence here. Come learn the corporate life, move to Kings Point, New York, and live next to me. We'll, we'll commute into the city together, by a limousine. So tell me about your life. You were born when? 
Uh, born in 1951. Okay. I'm having my 50th high school reunion this year. That's great. Parents were living where at this time? Uh, for six months when I was born, we lived in uh, an area called Cambria Heights and then moved to Rockville Center. And I was there until I was eight years old. And then from eight to 18, we moved to Kings Point, New York. So really what happened was when you moved to Kings Point, New York, that's when you got the bug for Broadway. Let's talk about Sid Caesar, your friend, and your, your entree to the Broadway lights. Oh, it's a, it's a fascinating, life-changing experience, Michael. It's, it's one of those, uh, you know, for third, fourth, and fifth grade, I'm, I'm best friends with this kid, Ricky. And, you know, we're hanging out after school together all the time. Uh, we're calling each other up on the phone to discuss the latest Twilight Zone episode we just saw. Uh, we're discussing movies. He's introducing me to a world that uh, I'd never even dreamt of, a comedy album with, with Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, uh, a 45 RPM spoof of rock and roll music his father had cut. And I'd never heard of his father before. Uh, it was 1962. And... Uh, but I was curious because I used to see his father at home at four o'clock in the afternoon. I'd say, I'd say, Ricky, doesn't your father work for a living? He says, yeah, he's an actor. He works at night. I said, what a concept. Everyone else knocks their head against the wall during the day. And he works at night when it's fun. Tell me more. Well, one day he said, my father's in a Broadway show and I'd never seen a Broadway show before because my parents thought it was too expensive to spend on a 10 year old kid. Uh, so the whole excitement of, uh, that I still get today coming into Manhattan from the island, uh, putting on a tie and uh, going into a real theater, not just those matchbox movie houses that you have right, on the you, island. And you also sat in the first row. We sat in the first row. They gave me a playbill. I got a ticket that said the name of the show. It didn't say admit one on it. It actually said the name of the show. So I had the playbill, a ticket, two souvenirs. Curtain hasn't even gone up yet. Now, you had no idea that Sid Caesar was from the show of shows, anything about? It was not part of my world at all. So when the curtain went up on the show musical, Little Me, written by Cy Coleman, did the music, Neil Simon did the book, uh, Carolyn Lee did the lyrics, and uh, Sid was starring in it. And the whole experience of, of having come into the city, sitting with the audience, watching this wonderful musical, interacting with the audience, storytelling in 3D, in real time, uh, was real exciting. Then, of course, we go backstage afterwards. Right, and you saw his little room that he had it. A stove and exactly. Had well, we had a little home away from home there. He had a TV. Friends are coming back. They're laughing. They're congratulating him. And I said, you know, so this what, is what I want to do with my you, life. So what did your parents say when you got home that night? Uh, I, th they wept. They wept. They wept until the day they died, uh, because theater was not a secure business to be in. Uh, I will grant them. They they gave me enough enough leeway to explore it. My father, used to, my father used to hang out with his friends from the country club, and one guy would say, oh, my son's a doctor, and uh, my son's a lawyer. Len, what's your son? Uh, actor! <laughs> you know, uh, because it wasn't the secure future. So, but so. He, he said, maybe the kid's got talent. Now, let's, let's talk about your first acting in high school. Uh, no, it was in junior high school. Harvey, right? You, Harvey. You played the cab driver. I was the uh, only eighth grader to be in the show, so it was a ninth grade production. I was the, the guy at the end. The taxi driver character comes on at the like, last five minutes of the show to help tie up the plot. Uh, there's a story about that. My, I think the story is great. Tell us yeah, the story. So uh, my father's there with, with his friend, and his friend's son is in the show too, but his son, his son has a bigger part. So through the entire show, his friend is looking at my father, and he's going, hey, hey Lenny, uh, isn't your son in this show? When's he coming on? And, you know, he's in the program. Well, I don't know. He's, he should be in the show. And two hours go by, and uh, he's still chiding my father. So my father's getting a, building up a head of steam here because he's, he's not happy with this. But finally, the saving grace was when I did finally come on stage, the entire auditorium got up to applaud. And I, I think it's because I was the only eighth grader in the show. It could be because they knew that the show was going to be over in five minutes. Right. Perhaps it was that way. <laughs> now... We have a picture of you with your mother and father and sister at camp. Were you in the shows? I, I was a junior counselor in charge of the theater one summer there at uh, camp, uh, Trails End Camp, which is still around today. Now, Great Neck, you were saying you were Great Neck uh, South? Or Great, Neck, Great Neck North. Great Neck North. And there you took all the, the theater courses and everything. You were involved very active in the theater also at that time. Oh, definitely. I was taking all the drama classes you could take during the day. I was, I was head of the uh, school, uh, the whole theater club after school. I wanted to do something with it. Uh, you know, the teacher had said, we've had presidents and, and, uh, of the 
drama club before, but they don't really do anything. So I wanted to do something. So I encouraged playwriting, directing. I actually did an unauthorized version of The Fantastics, a musical. And that was unusual for the Great Neck North because the music department would never talk to the drama department. So to get a musical done was impossible. So I did it on my own. Okay. You graduated high school in 1969. You go to CW Post for one year. Right. And then you changed to Boston University. How did you decide on BU? Well, BU had one of the finest theater departments in the country. And, and today, they're still the same six you know, universities that really offer uh, a conservative uh, form of education in the theater. And I was looking for that kind of uh, education. So you know, BU, NYU, University of Michigan, Northwestern, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Yale has a good graduates, and Juilliard, you know. And, so what happens at BU during the summer? You had summer stock, right, when you were? I was able to get jobs outside of the school doing summer stock. Uh, I was able to do uh, theater at the, in, in Monticello. Uh, I was at the Monticello Tent Arena. And this, this gave me a chance to actually learn uh, you know, theater outside of the educational system, which was basically classic theater at Boston University. They didn't specialize in musicals. But uh, in Summerstock, I was able to learn about George Gershwin doing Anything Goes, I was able to learn about Cole Porter, Gershwin doing Girl Crazy, uh, and even HMS Pinafore. I learned about Gilbert and Sullivan. Right, and we have a picture of you in the HMS Pinafore. Yes, oh, that was, that was uh, yes, at the Forestburg Summer Theater. Okay. Still around today, too. So 1973, what happens then? I graduate from BU, and uh, the Holy Grail back then was regional theater. So I was trying to go out into the country to, to stretch my legs. But fate took me back to New York City. And, uh, but I was determined to, uh, to make it through New York. And so eventually I was able to get uh, a job at the, a job. <laughs> I, I get an, an inter internship at the New Jersey Shakespeare Festival some, a year after I graduated. And while I'm there, I'm telling my father, I know I just graduated from, from school, uh, but I need another $350 to go to this internship at the New Jersey Shakespeare Festival. He goes, what, what, what does that entail? He says, well, I'm going to build their sets, I'm going to hang their lights, I'm going to do their publicity and, and act in their shows. And my father says, and you're going to pay them $350 for room and board? I go, Dad, it's, it's part of my education. It's, it's right. further and going. I'm, it's, it's an investment. And he, God bless him, he bought it. The big thing in acting is to get the equity card. When I was at the New Jersey Shakespeare Festival, uh, you, get that, you get that feeling like, I've got to join the union. I've got to be part of what's going on here. I'm a professional. I've got to get that equity card. Our stage manager had worked at a theater called Little Theater on the Square in Sullivan, Illinois. And he, was, uh, he got word that they wanted to extend their summer stock season into Thanksgiving, into the fall. But he was losing all his interns. And if I was willing to go out to Sullivan, he said that he, uh, he'll give you a contract at the end of the run to star, to, to, star, to be in the uh, show before the end of the season and you can get your equity card with that. So I bundled up my bags and out to Sullivan, Illinois. And Sullivan, Illinois is really the middle of nowhere. I mean, you're, you're 250 miles from Chicago, 200 miles from St. Louis. The closest thing an hour away was the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. Uh, but people would travel. They would travel for miles to see Peter Palmer in Oklahoma, which I was in. Right, and Peter Palmer was Little Abner, right? He was the Little Abner on Broadway, and so he was playing in Oklahoma there. So when do you uh, get your equity card? I got in uh, that fall of uh, 1974. So it's fall 1974, you come back to New York, but then you had the bug you wanted to be in L.A. New York was going through a tough period during that time, especially the theater. Uh, I was able to get jobs doing some summer stock, I toured with Van Johnson. Uh, I, I did, played the Pocono Playhouse and Cape Cod Playhouse in Algonquin, Maine. Did the Royal Ponciana down in Florida. Did dinner theater at the Fox Hollow Dinner Theater here on Long Island. But a lot of the actors and the writers were abandoning New York for Los Angeles. There just wasn't enough work here to go. So I followed, uh, followed my friends and out to California I went. So. You wanted to get your SAG card, okay, and after. But California wasn't the, the, the right chemistry for Stewart Land, right? Well, I'd gotten my SAG card in New York uh, through tenacious means, but I was doing commercials and extra work on right. films. But in L.A., there's no center. There's no heart to the city. Now, I love a walking city. I'm a dyed-in-the-wool New Yorker. I love this town. And uh, L.A. just not an offer. Where do you meet people? Where do you discuss theater? Where do you have intelligent conversations? They, uh, they don't, you know, you're still getting the New York Times because you want a real newspaper. Right. So you stayed there for how long? Uh, one year. 
Okay, then you come back to New York, and that's when you meet uh, Jimmy Niederland? Well, I worked for Jimmy as a script reader for several years in between there. And uh, when I came back, uh, he offered me a job as an assistant house manager at the right, Brooks at the Atkinson, Brooke Atkinson Theater. Theater. Uh, during the same time next year. Right, and right. that you, you learned all of the, the, the difficulties of running a theater. The real nuts and bolts about how to manage it, how to maintain it. It's a building, there's a boiler, there are problems, there's heat, there's seats, patrons with tickets for the wrong night, uh, deliveries, uh, you know, anything goes on, emergencies. So, yes, I learned really the nuts and bolts of running a So a what happens after that? Well, this was a time when producing was not a popular form. And, and in fact, uh, there were very few producers at that time. Mostly they were the theater owners trying to fill their theaters. Those were dark times for the theater industry as a whole. Uh, and in the late 70s, it started to get better. But I asked Jimmy Needlander, I said, uh, I'd like to learn to be a producer. What can I do? And he said, well, if you invest in one of my shows, you can be there for the entire progress. You can be there for the casting, the publicity, the marketing. That's the best way to learn. So I'd been a script reader for him. And I went through a stack of scripts they had. And finally, I came up with one I thought was, was perfect for me. Uh, it was called Whose Life Is It Anyway? It was a, a meaty play about a quadriplegic who wants to have the plug pulled on him because he can't be the artist that he was made to be, he was born to be. And we actually won uh, a Tony Award for Best Actor for him that year, for Tom Conti, uh, but we lost Best Play to The Elephant Man. Okay. But what I did was I was able to sit in on meetings and able to get a sense of what, you know, seat of the pants learning of how, what producing was about. So that was like the first show where I got assistant to the producer on. Right, so how do you then get involved with working with your dad at Rapid America? Uh, well, when I was a house manager, I was working eight performances a week, which means I'm working at night, except for Wednesday matinee and the weekends. Uh, so it gave me a lot of free time that I used to hang out with my father uh, and have lunch with him. And uh, when the chairman of the board saw me there with my father, he'd say, Lenny, if he's going to spend all that time with you, you might as well put him to work. So they hired me as a junior executive at Rapid. So after Rapid, you come back to Broadway to do what? Well, I saw an opportunity when Jimmy had a mortgage coming due. And uh, I was able to arrange with a bank to take over the mortgage on a theater, which was not an easy thing to do. Uh, banks were kind of uh, antagonistic towards the theater where there was no steady cash flow coming out of it. Uh, but I saw an opportunity. One, because it was New York, my favorite town. Right. And to have a piece of New York was, was amazing. And of course, it was a theater, which was my life. So I said, this is something I'm going to take a chance on. I might make less money than other people. Uh, I might, but I'll have a hell of a time. And what happens after that? Well, after that, we, we, boy, it was tough. We went through several shows that just did not work. I mean, I did, I did the grand tour, you know, Jerry Herman doing the music, Joel Gray starring in it, um, uh, Mike, Mark uh, Bramble and Michael Stewart doing the book. Ran three months and closed. So uh, when do you do La Cage à Faux? That was a, a show that shouldn't have won. Oh, well. But, but it was your first Tony? My first Tony and a real, you know, a real career changer. Uh, I, I, I'd been nominated for Woman of the Year in 1981, and, and, and then I was introduced to Lacage, Jerry Herman's score. I was familiar with the, uh, the play, the movie of Lacage, and I thought it was a brilliant production. I said, this is going to be exciting. It's funny. It's socially uh, changing. It's, it's, it's innovative and engaging, and the score is terrific. And all my friends are telling me, Stu, gay musical on Broadway. That's a killer. You're, you're going to die. You just, just ended your career. I'm going, don't you understand? That's what theater's about. It's challenging. It's supposed to enlighten. And, uh, and so, so I didn't listen to my friends. I went ahead and did it. And you God bless, it worked out. You've won six Tonys. What shows are they? Well, La Cage aux Folles, Will Rogers' Follies, uh, Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, Thoroughly Modern Millie, uh, Jay Johnson, the, the Two and Only, and, uh, oh, and War Horse. When do you get involved that you decide to be an author? You have three books. Well, the, the seed started when I was in L.A. Uh, trying to find jobs. And I figured, well, one way to do it is to write a play for myself to be in. So I wrote a play and inadvertently became the first show I produced, too, because even though that wasn't the intent. Uh, so I actually mounted a production of, uh, of In the Wings uh, at a theater there, got, hired a director, got a theater, did my own press, uh, did a marketing campaign on a, on a small budget, uh, and it got it up and running and got some, you know, fair reviews on it. So that was the play. The first book? The first book was uh, Let's Put On a Show, which, was, which really detailed my experiences putting on that show. It's kind of a primer for anyone who's interested in putting on a, a production for community, for charity raising, uh, for even the off-Broadway. 
So it gives you an idea of how to raise money, how to rehearse, how to pick the project, and how to involve the community in what you're doing. And how did you decide to write the second book, uh, Jews on Broadway? When I was in college, I had done a paper on the Yiddish theater. And there was such few information to be gleaned from the books and periodicals that were available. Uh, I felt that there needed, it was, a, it was a vacuum that needed to be filled. No one had done it recently and certainly didn't involve directors, writers, choreographers, you know, and the performers as well. Right, and you tell the history of the Jews in the theater going back to the turn of the century. The uh, Haskalah movement, the birth of the Yiddish theater, which really sprouted most of the stars of the day, the Edward G. Robinsons and John Garfields. Right, and the Molly Beacons. And, and, and the so. Paul, Paul, Paul Muniz uh, that came out of the Yiddish theater. And of course, the acting style, the whole uh, Adler story, Jacob Adler, Luther Adler, and the, and the Stella Adler, who established the actor's studio here, and really the style of acting of America for the last hundred years. And then you decide on a, a third book, Blacks on Broadway, right? It, you know, it was one of those stories, again, where there was a vacuum. No one had really done any kind of serious approach on the African-American contribution to the American theater. And that's what makes the American theater so unique. We're able to involve different cultures in what we're doing. Uh, the whole idea of diversifying and inclusion uh, is, is really essential in the creative process. And theater does that, collaborating, working with people from all different backgrounds. You're called Mr. Broadway, and, but one of your shows um, made the, uh, the Joe Allen Wall of Fame, right? <laughs> oh, God. Yes, well, jo Joe Allen's, as you know, is a famous Broadway uh, Dennis, place for Denison's Hangout. It's a Broadway restaurant. And uh, they have a brick wall. And on that wall are an amazing amount of posters. It's the wall of flops, the biggest flops on Broadway. And there's some big names on that wall. You know, Hal Prince is on that wall. And David Merrick is on that wall. And, and yes, Stuart Lane is on that so, wall. So how'd Frankenstein end up that way? You know, it had a nice pedigree. It came out of the Louis Actors Theater in Louisville. We had uh, our special effects guy, Bran Ferrin, who had just come off a movie called Altered States, was our special effects. We, we recreated the entire Frankenstein lab with the Jacob's Ladders, you know, the zzz stuff we had. Right, we and a very expensive elevator, I remember. Oh, we had an expensive elevator. We had, we had sound. We had the surround sound that would rumble the seats when the castle collapsed at the end, and the critics hated it. One night. One right. night, One most person. expensive non-musical to close in one night. Now, was your wife involved with you at that time in the, uh, the No, if she was, she wouldn't have let me do that. Okay, speaking <laughs> about your wife, who's a producer and your partner in uh, the production company, tell me about how you met uh, Bonnie. I was working on a, a musical based on a Mark Twain short story called The Change in the Air at the Edison Theater on 47th Street, and she was working at a travel station on cable TV. And this particular episode was What's Happening in New York? So she came in backstage to interview me at the theater. So that's how you met her. That's how we so, met. Okay, so let's talk about Broadway HD, which is, I think, the best example. It's Netflix for Broadway. That, that's a great way to describe it, really. Uh, it is a, it's revolutionizing the way people can appreciate live theater from Broadway. We have over 300 shows now on Broadway HD, we can, we, you can get on the internet, on your iPhone, your cell phone, your iPad, your Apple TV or your Roku, BroadwayHD.com. We have musicals, we've got plays, we've got from the West End of, uh, of, of London, Broadway, and some regional theaters as well. Right. We've, we've teamed up with some major institutions and, right. and distributors, we've got Fathom, we do In Cinema, we've got uh, Channel 13 as our production arm, uh, and we've got musicals like, we just, we just put up the, um, King and I, with uh, that, that was Lincoln Center. Now, what about uh, the Guinness Book of World Records? You were saying with Broadway. We're, Broadway HD, God bless, only three and a half years old. But our, one of our first major accomplishments was doing a live stream of a Broadway show. It was from Studio 54, She Loves Me. We hit over 84 countries. We were getting emails from around the world. Can you imagine what time it was in Nicaragua when they, when they actually you know, saw it? Uh, and we got, we got Australia. Uh, I mean, the impact of what Broadway can do uh, around the world was, was immense and immediate. People love Broadway from around the world. They, they save their money, they come here to be at Broadway. And this way you're giving the opportunity to see Broadway on television, giving people the, the opportunity that they couldn't get. They're living yeah, in we're breaking down barriers of, 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 uh, of, of, of economics to make it affordable and in uh, availability. So if you can't afford to come to New York, you don't have the time, and, and it's a limited run show. I mean, we have Kevin Klein doing Cyrano de Bergerac. We've got Memphis, uh, you know, all the top Broadway right. shows. 
Let's talk about family. You and Bonnie, you have a total of what? Five, five, five all together. Okay, so tell me what each one is doing. And well, the oldest, she's, uh, she's about 34 years old. She's teaching fourth grade here in New York at the Cadman School on the Upper East Side. And her name? That's uh, Eliana. Okay. She's got uh, two children now. So, yes, I'm a grandparent. Then I've got, uh, I've got uh, Harley. Harley is in Japan. She's finishing her third year with the JET program teaching English to Japanese students. And she's planning on staying another year now to study at the Nagoya School to learn uh, Japanese even, even better. My other daughter is a junior at Tisch School of the name? Arts at NYU. That's Leah. And she's having a blast. She's actually in rehearsals for like two shows right now. And the, the twins? And they got two twin boys. One's uh, both in seventh grade. They're twins. One's at the Horace Mann School and one's at the Stephen Gaynor School here in New York. Now, you and Bonnie have given back quite a bit to Boston University. So for the last 20 years, Bonnie and I have set up an endowment to help students come to New York and audition before they graduate. So they can actually audition for casting directors and producers and writers so they can see them before they graduate school, so they can hit the ground running when they come out. Uh, we're very active with Bonnie's alma mater, which is Emerson, Emerson College, and the University of Massachusetts. If there's anyone out there who's interested in studying theater and musical theater, Boston University would be a great place to go. Okay. So, you know, even though Dad and Mom were worried about Little Caesar, okay, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, I think going to the show, being involved, You've truly become, as they say, Mr. Broadway. And best of luck on BroadwayHD.com because I know it's going to be a great product and just growing by leaps and bounds. And thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me on the show, Michael. Thank you.